In 2016, I've interviewed employees from the AdLib sound card company, and they gave me five and a quarter inch floppies with some of their backups from the day. Even though I could easily read them on my older systems, I had no way of actually archiving and preserving the data in there. USB 3.5 inch floppy drives are easy to find online, 5.25 variants do not exist. The main thing preventing that from ever happening is that 5.25 drives use 12 volts, and that is way above what USB can allow through its cables being 5 volts. Searching online, there seems to be a few less satisfying solutions, because they rely on having older 5 and a quarter drives available and in working order, and sooner or later all the drives will be unsalvageable. Companies like Cryoflux and DeviceSide have offerings that rely on custom hardware to bridge the gap between newer systems and older drives, by using a custom controller with USB on one side and floppy cable on the other. I chose the device side FD5025 option simply because my need is focused on archival and not data recovery. Including shipping to Canada, the FD5025 cost me $115. It includes the controller board, USB cable of around 10 feet, and a 20 plus inch floppy cable. The board is powered through the USB port directly, so there is no need for a Molex connection. If I take a look at the Cryoflux equivalent of that package, it would be the premium version, which is currently 143 euros, so $211, not including shipping. The FD1525 board is quite thin, around 1 by 3 inches. It has a USB and floppy ports, and two screws and brackets to use in a standard hard disk drive bay. I think the company's intention here is to use it internally with a floppy drive inside a modern computer. The controller chip is proprietary and has device written on it. The floppy connector has the pin 1 nearest the USB connector, and I'm very happy that the floppy cable comes with the edge connector, the same edge connector that was present on older floppy drives, like the one we will be using. So for the price, I think it's a pretty great bundle in my opinion. In our case, the floppy drive will be fitted inside an external enclosure, originally used for a CD-ROM drive. The enclosure I got for free a long time ago in a bundle of multiple computer parts. It has an internal fan, uses an external 12 volt power supply, and should be big enough to contain the floppy drive if I got enough of the insides. Since the CD-ROM inside it was in the IDE standard, uh, the enclosure already converts the 12 volts into a Molex connector, and it has an IDE to USB connector, along with RCA audio outputs on the back which will not be used. The device side documentation for the FD5025 is very specific. Only 1.2 megabyte drives are supported and TIAC models are highly recommended. It was time to check my pile of floppy drives to see if there is any that would meet these criteria. Out of the 8 I have available, only 3 were 1.2 megabyte drives, the rest were 360 kilobytes. There's a YE data for IBM and a NEC drive along with the TIAC which I picked. FD55GFR is the exact model number we are going to test today. It's time to disassemble the enclosure. I already removed the CD-ROM drive in the past, and now we work on the enclosure itself. Now we see what we will be working with. Um, what will stay in the end is the power connector and the Molex plug and the fan. Everything else will have to go. Removing the RCA plugs and the CD-ROM controller with the USB port. We are left with the bare bones enclosure, but there is still a problem. There are risers for the old controller board that are in the way of the FD5025. Let's remove them as well. Once removed, the space gives us a better understanding of where the new controller could go. 
Let's mark the rough positions for the screw holes and USB port, which doesn't line up with the current opening. Too bad. Flipping the screws and using plastic risers will help us keep the FD5025 at an acceptable distance from the enclosure. Let's add the risers. They are threaded for a different screw type, so it's a bit painful. Always a good idea to sanity check any measurements. Everything fits so far. Let's drill the screw holes that will hold the controller in place and let's dremel the square opening for the USB connector. Punching the remaining metal is easy. The openings seem to line up, so far so good. I use computer case screws here because it's what I have in abundance in my toolbox. And looking at the result, it's very promising. Dry fitting the backplate back inside the enclosure we mark the new openings that need to be made, two for the new screws and one for the USB port. See? Fits like a glove. Time to screw the backplate in place and move forward with the project. USB connection works with no hitches. Time to dry fit everything with the actual floppy drive. And it's a tight fit, tighter than I would have initially thought. Will we be able to use a ribbon cable? I have some fears now. So by looking at the cable, it's clear that it has way too much length and will need to be shortened if this project is to work. And here is my result. I know there are other ways to make ribbon cables more flexible, but they are rare as it is and risking putting a knife on it and cutting a wire by accident is not in my plans. It goes in smoothly and the notch is in the correct side. And the Molex connector goes as well. All my jumper settings have been done off screen and they were pretty easy with the guide included by device side. The only thing left is to secure the drive in the enclosure and it uses four screws underneath to achieve it. It's strange because in my years of computer work, I've only ever used side screws. I always wondered why there were threads underneath, and now I know. Time to power on the device, see if anything burns. So far so good. Let's put in a known working floppy and see what happens. Be sure to plug in the USB cable first before starting the software. If not, the drive won't be recognized and available in the list of drives. Select the expected floppy type. A quick test to see if the correct type has been selected is to try browsing the disk contents. If unable to see the file listing, it means that the wrong type has been selected. In this case, the floppy is of 360k. If we try browsing again, we see the file listing and that the dates are from 1992. After that, we need to select a folder where the program will save the image files. And a word of warning, if the file name already exists in there, the existing file will be overwritten. So to be sure, let's type 3001 and press capture. If it works, it will show a message that the program has successfully read the disk. In the specified folder, the program creates image files directly, which you can open with WinImage, a cool little piece of software by Gilles Volant. In my opinion, that is worth every penny. Inside the image file, all the files are present with their original date codes. Checking that there are no wires getting pinched, I clip the top back in place and snap the sides back in their positions. The fun of having the drive within an enclosure 
is that now I can stay at my desk and I can archive things on my modern computer without the need to tinker with old equipment, plus it allows me to archive the actual disks without transporting the data to intermediary 3.5 inch floppies from computer to computer. I would grade the hardware 9 out of 10. The hardware is plug and play, includes the cables and everything you need for a quick start. It loses one point because I would have much appreciated to be able to use it as a real floppy drive inside Windows, not just a disk imager. The documentation I rate 9 out of 10. It is short and to the point, but I would say that similarly to the device side website, it is very bare bones and pictures would have helped especially with the jumper settings. I would rate the software 6 out of 10. Um, I think the software is the Achilles heel of this package in my opinion. A um, couple of things from an interface aspect or usability aspect could be fixed easily. I think the file overwriting problem should at least prompt me when it happens. Uh, the file and folder should keep the last that has been used from the last session uh, so you don't have to retype and reselect everything every time you open the software. Um, if you type in a folder that does not exist, it should be created by default and not cause an error. When iterating with the disk type, uh, because you have a floppy that you don't know what's on there, having the browse window in the same view would help iterate more quickly between disk types. Also, having a refresh button to redetect the FD5025 in case you either haven't plugged the USB or it has become disconnected momentarily uh, would be super useful as well. So there you have it. I greatly recommend the device side data FD5025 and I'll get my archiving mood in gear. Uh, thanks for watching the Soundcard database and see you next time.